boys and girls, students of Buddhist Sunday School and Dharma classes, parents, grandparents, and teachers of Buddhist Sunday School and Dharma classes. Good morning. May you all be well, happy, and peaceful. Now today we are going to do an inspiring presentation titled Life of the Buddha in Pictures. The captions are in English and Chinese. The narration, of course, is in uh, English. Now many of you have heard the life history of the Buddha, right? Through your books also you have read. But now we are going to use lots of pictures to inspire you with the life of the Buddha. Now, of course, we cannot show all the things and events in the Buddha's life of 80 years, but we are going to pick some important events in the life of the Buddha and we hope you will be inspired. Now, as usual, we are going to launch the PowerPoint on this presentation. Now, I think it's not necessary now to see my picture now. It's been more important to see the pictures pertaining to the Buddha, isn't it? Okay, so let us now launch the PowerPoint. I uh, see the first cover slide, very, very inspiring, uh, showing, of course, these are works of art from different cultures and countries. Uh. Uh, here you have the showing of the Buddha's birth, his enlightenment, and his passing away in Parinibbana. Uh, that's the commemoration of the Visak uh, to commemorate the three important events in Buddha's life, right? So I'll read the narration of the story and explain a bit. Now, the first one concerns ascetic Sumida and Dipankara Buddha. Now, one story goes like this. Uh, some say it is a legend. And, uh, anyway, it is quite inspiring. Now, the word ascetic... Uh, uh, refers to a hermit or you can say a religious person, a recluse that leads a very, very harsh, hard life, uh, very severe discipline, you no know, enjoying yourself or comfort, but doing things like praying, meditating, and he live quite a hard life, right? Wandering from place to place, with uh, very little food, there is fasting, maybe just eating one meal a day. Uh, there is ascetic. And some even go to the extent of uh, torturing the body, you know, some Hindu, uh, Hindu ascetics, like sleeping on the bed of nails, uh, and then uh, standing most of the time, uh, and so on. Uh. Uh, so that's ascetic. So there was this ascetic Sumida. Uh, one day, he met with one of the early Buddhas, according to uh, the account, uh, very, very, very long time ago, there was this Dipankara Buddha. And he was going through the village where Sumida lived. And Sumida was a, a religious person, and he was trying to seek the truth. So he made the aspiration that one day he will become the Buddha, according to the story. And, you know, he laid himself down you know, with his long hair, laid himself down on the ground, which was very muddy, full of water and mud, a muddy warm ground. So he actually was paying great respect to the the Pankara Buddha, and uh, he allowed the Buddha to go over him so that the Buddha would not dirty his feet. La. That's what the story says. La. But anyway, the thing was, he made aspiration, a very strong vow that one day, he too, 
uh, will become a Buddha, the fully enlightened one. But of course, this uh, is just a story and maybe a legend. Uh. But uh, according to the scriptures, uh, the Buddha that was uh, met by the Bodhisattva, that means uh, uh, Siddhartha Gautama in his previous one, the previous life uh, uh, as a human being, he met with the the previous Buddha, the the one before Siddhartha Gautama was supposed to be Kasapa Buddha, la, right? And he renounced under him and studied under him. But anyway, this is just the story of the ascetic Sumada and Dipankara. Now, so the story uh, goes that, uh, you know, of course, uh, um, he, the Bodhisattva, before that, he probably had, li uh, he had lived many, many human lives and, uh, as devas and uh, so on. Uh. So, the life before he became a human being, he was in a heaven known as Tusita heaven, right? Uh, here you can see the account. Before his final rebirth, the Bodhisattva spent his life he was uh, in Tusita heaven, the high heaven. And the devas, the gods, right? Implored, appealed to the Bodhisattva to be reborn on earth to become a Buddha. Uh, this is also uh, a story. But probably... All right, that uh, it was the cause of nature that he will be reborn uh, as a human being and to become the Buddha because he had cultivated uh, for a long time, all right, and he had probably attained uh, quite a very high spiritual level uh, under the previous Buddha of uh, Kasapa Buddha, la, right? So then, according to the account. Right. So one day there was this queen, uh, the wife of a uh, so-called, uh, I mean, actually a Sakyan clan. Uh, some say that he's a king. Some say he's uh, maybe uh, you no know, one, you no know, nobleman. But anyway, so this queen uh, went to sleep, right? And she dreamt of an elephant uh, going around her, you no, know, right? And also some devas fetching her to the mountains to take a bath. So a lot of accounts. Uh. But anyway, in this story of the white elephant going around this Queen Maya, right? Uh, in this story, uh, going around, very, very interesting, isn't it? Then the queen conceived, which means that, right, that uh, she uh, had the Baby or uh, Peter Siddhartha going into the womb already, la, according to the story. La. Uh, uh, so that was this story. Now, then, of course, after we having conceived, another she became pregnant, so very happy, la, the king, la, so that Dana. And he was on a full moon Visat day, you know. Uh, now, of course, it's more than. 2,500 years ago already. And he was at the place in Lumbini, present-day Nepal, that Queen Maya, the Bodhisattva's mother, right? She was going back to her parents' house. That was the custom at that time to deliver the baby. But no time, huh? Uh, the baby could be born anytime. And he was at this place, Lumbini, and that she... Uh, was having labor pains already. So she stood uh, holding the branch of a sala tree. And this picture shows it. La. So Siddhartha Gautama was born. And according to the story, the devas came. Nature was at its best. Beautiful flowers and plants and so on. La. And according to the story, as soon as the baby Siddhartha was born, he took seven steps. And each step, uh, cause a lotus flower to bloom out. No, so seven steps. And he could speak. Uh, and he took the seven steps. And as he took the seven steps, he spoke these words. Chief am I in this world. I'm the greatest, uh, he said, uh, of this world. And he declared that this would be his last human birth. Already. In other words, he would become a Buddha in this 
President last human life as Siddhartha Gautama. Uh, so that is this bird scene. Now let's look at the next one. Now, this one now very interesting also. So it was in the custom uh, a certain number of days after the birth of baby Siddhartha. So you call the wise man uh, to come and uh, maybe read the fortune of this uh, um, baby. And then the important is to uh, give the name. Uh, uh. So the name given was Siddhartha. And Siddhartha means a wish fulfilled on uh, Malay, you can say impian, impian, terchapai, uh, a wish that would come true, uh, uh, that would be realized, uh, fulfilled. And because the family name was Gautama, so the prince was named Siddhartha Gautama, right? Siddhartha Gautama. So that is this naming ceremony. Now, so the interesting event, the one interesting event was the Plow Festival. You know, in the area Kapilavastu, the countryside, you know, so they had the farm. So, you know, certain times of the year, they would have to go to uh, do the planting, right? The plowing and they use the uh, bulls or uh, the cows, right? And they will do the planting. Then after a certain period, right, then it will be time to harvest uh, maybe the paddy, paddy or some other products like the cereals and so on. So it will be a big celebration, you know. Huh? You can see that sometimes in Hindu, uh, Hindi movies, huh? Uh, where they have the plow festival or uh, harvesting time. Many people will come, the villagers, and they will sing and dance and celebrate. And of course, they will do the harvesting. So, but this baby Siddhartha followed the, the people, his family members and the workers and so on. Uh. But he did not want to take part in all those dancing, singing and celebration. Instead, he wandered uh, to a tree, you know. Uh, under the jambu tree, you know. At the time, he was just seven years old. And he meditated. Uh, it was the annual plow festival. And now uh, he was so fantastic, you know. At that young age, uh, nobody taught him and so on. He could meditate already. And he reached very high concentration. He reached a one-pointedness and attained the, what we call the deep absorptions. Uh, the jhanas, uh, probably the first jhana or second jhana, very high meditative state of the mind. How could he do it? Isn't it? Right? So definitely he must have cultivated in previous lives already. Like in the previous life, it, this uh, monk, uh, the venerable Maha Kasapa, uh, I'm not sorry, uh, Kasapa Buddha, uh, the Kasapa Buddha, so he had renounced under him, he had trained as a monk already. So now this life uh, continues, right? So that is the Plow Festival. Now actually then he grew up with a very good education. He was a very, very special child, you know, right? Very many good qualities, the Bodhisattva. Bodhisattva here actually means the Buddha to be, that he would... Uh, cultivate and become a Buddha. That's the meaning of Bodhisattva, a Buddha to be. He had this metta, real loving kindness, you know, right? Full of metta, very caring, compassionate. Now, this Siddhartha had a cousin by the name of Devadatta. Now, this Devadatta, right, from the time he was younger, uh, was not really a very good character, lah, right? He was maybe rough, right? And, uh, you know, he uh, liked to go and uh, kill animals, sort of hunting with his bow and arrow, you know. Uh, those days, of course, you know, kings and uh, noblemen, so they like to hunt also. Uh. So, uh, one day, he used his bow and arrow uh, and shot down a swan, you know. And he wanted to, you know, take the swan. Uh. He told Siddhartha, uh, Siddhartha, of course, saw it. Say that this belonged to me, I want it. But Siddhartha saw that the, the swan was wounded. 
So he was very, very compassionate, full of metta. So he took the swan and decided to nurture or to uh, take care of the swan until uh, the swan uh, was healed. Uh. Uh, so you see the great kindness. So actually he saved the life of the swan. Then later on, of course, uh, the swan was released. Uh. Uh, so that this actually shows the fantastic metta and loving kindness of Siddhartha Gautama. Uh, so this is the future uh, Buddha. Right? Uh, he will become the uh, enlightened Buddha, uh, as you will see in the story. Now, you know, it was the custom, uh, the Hindu custom during that time, uh, that a person of a certain age uh, would be married. Their parents would uh, arrange for a, a lady, right, for him to marry. So, of course, this was carried out. And at the age of 16, Prince Siddhartha married a beautiful lady by the name of Yusudara whose mother was the sister of the Buddha's father. Anyway, right, that is the cow that Siddhartha right, actually married at the age of 16, according to Hindu custom. And not long later, he had a, a son, uh, only one child, one son, child, named uh, Rahulala. But you see, uh, he uh, was a Bodhisattva, a Buddha to be. His destiny was to become a Buddha, right? So even though he was having a very, very comfortable, luxurious life, you know, uh, the father had three palaces built for him, one for the rainy season, one for the cold season, one for the hot season. And there were these... Uh, uh, beautiful ladies dancing, singing, all the good food, but he was not really peaceful and happy inside because in the depth of the mind, uh, right, he had spiritual qualities wanting to seek the truth uh, because, as I said just now, right, uh, he was a disciple of Kasapa Buddha, the previous Buddha before me. So this carried on in the depth of his mind. Uh. So... As I said, uh, he had uh, Rahula, one son, uh, born, right? And actually, before I forget, the mother actually passed away seven days after he was born, and he was brought up by the auntie, uh, Pajapati, uh, Maha Pajapati. Uh, the auntie brought him out. Uh, so he had a good education and so on. But all the while, uh, he was uh, not really uh, happy. Uh, he wanted something, you know. Uh? And the father very protective. Uh, make sure that he uh, would not just simply go out and mix with all the people who are suffering and so on. right? But one day, right, with his uh, charity, uh, right, you can say something like a servant, uh, right? He managed to get out of the palace. Uh, let us read this to see the significant event, very important event. So during that time, during his excursion, uh, he managed to go outside the palace. He saw four things uh, that provoked his thinking, make him think very deeply. You know? And what did he see? Uh, this came to be known as the four sides. The first thing he saw was an old man. You know? well, he was very, very shocked. Uh, Right to see a uh, person so old uh. in the palace, probably he had not seen such an old person like this. Uh. So, you know, full of suffering, uh, you know, could not even move properly. So, he asked the charity, uh, the servant that accompanied him, right? He said, What is this? Then the servant told him that everyone will have to grow old. Uh. Uh, then, after that, he saw somebody uh, very, very sick. Uh, very, very sick, coughing and uh, uh, walking so weakly and so on. And again, the charioteer told him that, you know, sickness is a natural thing. All will be sick at one time or other, especially when we grow old. And then the third sight uh, he saw was somebody that had passed away. Really. And in the Hindu custom, uh, you see uh, that they would uh, wrap the dead body in the white cloth and then they will fetch it, 
the dead body uh, to the crematorium ground. Uh. Uh, you can see that, for example, in the river Ganges. And when we were there, we saw, right? We sailed along the, uh, the river Ganges, and then you could see uh, dead bodies being burned or cremated, uh, right? Wow, so then uh, you were very, very taken. Uh. Well, you, it provoked his thinking, uh, right? about all these sort of things though no? and again the charioteer told him uh, Channa, the charioteer told him uh, that everybody would die you know uh, then after that the final side the fourth side he saw a very peaceful holy man you know so peaceful he was very touched the mind was affected in a very good way he his mind became peaceful and focused seeing such a person you know a holy man so this observations of four sites uh, affected him deeply you know, because he had already cultivated in previous lives uh, right and uh, he made him realize uh, that uh, all he all beings would suffer you know. so then he made this determination uh, that he would seek the truth he would want to go on the spiritual spiritual journey as a wandering ascetic, just now I explained the word ascetic already, huh? a religious person trying to seek the truth, but living very difficult conditions, huh? Huh? Uh, wandering around, no proper place to stay, and then uh, very little food, right? Uh, one day, one meal perhaps, and all the hardship, huh? that's the uh, ascetic, huh? right? Some would even torture their bodies, right? And this was what he determined in the mind to do. Uh, so let us see uh, what happens next. <coughs> so at the age of 29, he made that determination that he would leave uh, the wife and son who was just born, right? So he was not really happy. He had greater objectives in life. He wanted to go out to seek the truth of why there is so much suffering, right? Of old age, sickness, and then death. All people would have this. He wanted to find out. Right? He was very, very special, isn't it? Uh, so one day, so yes. Yeah, made out the mind to leave the palace, isn't it? Right? So the story goes, uh, various versions of the story. La. One story is that, uh, of course, right? He uh, say, uh, at one night, he said goodbye. The wife was sleeping, the baby was sleeping already. So he said goodbye, right? And then left the palace, right? Left the palace, uh, accompanied by... Uh, his charity lah. Uh, at the time, no, no vehicle, no car, and so on. So the lab, you know, on a horse probably lah, right? Horse. So there was this. Uh, but another, I mean, according to the scripture, there's this account that actually he, he actually told the parents uh, uh, that he wanted to renounce really to leave the palace, and the parents uh, did not agree. But somehow or other, right? He of course twenty nine years old, really, lah, right? So he decided and he made up his mind. And then uh, he uh, shaved his head and then put on something like a rope and so on. And he left. La. That's another account. La. It doesn't matter. What is important is he left the palace. Right? And it was a renunciation. So this was the great renunciation. La. Right? As I told you, he was accompanied by the, uh, by the, you can say, servant, no? the charioteer. Chanala, the name charioteer, uh, royal charioteer, uh, one who would ride the chariot, right? And then uh, tend to his knees and so on. Uh. And there was this horse, Kandaka. So it was a very symbolic act of cutting off the head you know, when they reached the river, the river, Anoma River. Uh, we had seen this river in India during the pilgrimage or so. He just as a symbol to tell that. I want to give up all the worldly things really, the comfort, the luxuries, huh? to renounce the worldly life. Being, uh, what is the motive? The objective is to actually lead the uh, spiritual path, right? the spiritual way, uh, to seek the truth 
as a hermit, as a recluse or ascetic until he well, finds the truth. Lah. Uh, so that was why he uh, had this renunciation. It's called the great renunciation, you know. Some people don't understand. They say, oh, you are so terrible, lah, leaving the, the wife and the child lah, and the other members of family. But they don't understand. This is the greatest sacrifice anybody can make, you know. Right? That he was having compassion for all the rest of sentient beings. Uh, beings as he wanted to find the truth to uh, resolve, uh, uh, to get out from suffering so that he could uh, help the other people uh, to preach the thing. So it was a very noble mission, uh, very difficult. Only uh, uh, a Buddha uh, could do that. Uh, very few Buddhas, uh, fully enlightened one. Uh, uh, so and later on, you will see actually how could he be so selfish? He actually was painful, but he made that sacrifice. But later on, he became enlightened. He went back to the family. So how can he say he is selfish? He's actually full of compassion, right? But sacrifice, you no. Know, uh, so you understand this, huh? Ah, uh, so for six years, you know, uh, he practiced austerity, you know. Austerity, uh, it means uh, living under very, very hard, harsh, severe living conditions. Uh, uh, great austerity, uh, like very little food, right? every time just, uh, you know, um, pursuing the spiritual part of praying, meditating. And then Hindus also have these ascetics, uh, right? And he followed the Hindu way like first, uh, so... Uh, torturing sometimes the body, you know, and uh, very little sleep. No such thing as enjoying all the comforts that we have, you know. Uh, uh, watching very good things, lah, and then uh, living comfortable life in luxury in the home. No such thing. It was a very tough life as an ascetic. Uh, uh, but he was very, very committed. All right? So he practiced these hard conditions of living in spirituality with a lot of uh, meditation striving uh, trying hard in the meditation with state fastness now what is the uh, man by state fastness now this would suggest uh, that he was very devoted very determined resolute he was committed committed to the quest uh, to the search for truth right for the truth of suffering uh, so that is some uh, that gives you some idea of steadfastness, uh, determination, commitment, devotion, right? Full of uh, resolute, right? Ah, uh, and uh, very diligent. All these qualities struggle. Uh, uh, you also had yeah, that type of quality uh, in order to attain enlightenment. Uh, uh, and because of the austerity and also his practice of asceticism, right? So you find he was very, very thin. The body reduced to just like a skeleton, you know. Uh, the scriptures describe the account. Uh, wow, really the body also. Uh, uh, very, very thin and uh, just like a skeleton already. Uh, also very, very weak. Uh, all right. Now, so now let's look at this one that uh, talks about Sujata. No? So he was wandering around the forest area. When he went to India, we went to that place you know, where Siddhartha spent six years as an ascetic, uh, wandering around in the forest area, uh, uh, trying to find the truth through basically meditation. Right? He had learned meditation also right, from uh, some great uh, holy people. Uh, uh, these holy people also uh, and some of them are the Brahmins, uh, uh, Hindu religion. Uh, the time Hindu religion was existing already. So he knew how to meditate. And don't forget, uh, he had also meditated in previous lives already. Uh, and even as a child, uh, seven years old, he had meditated. So one day he was uh, just wandering around. And the body was very, very weak, you know. So he fell into a, a very uh, shallow river, uh, you can say. It was a stream or small river. And he was so weak, he could not even uh, get himself out you know, of the river. So it happened that during that time, there was this village girl, uh, cow girl, you know, call it. and the name was Sujata. So Sujata saw him, uh, he was struggling, uh, so weak in the river. And Sujata pulled him out of the river. 
He was so weak, so light already. Yeah, so we went the lady uh, who just helped him out from very shallow river. And then Sujata uh, gave the Bodhisattva uh, some food. And it was a uh, milk rice, uh, you know. Right. And this picture uh, showed that uh, he was, uh, you know, uh, <laughs> looking very, very good like a monk. So not so accurate on uh, this one. Well, this one uh, would be better that he was uh, still an ascetic, isn't it? Right? Very, very thin and weak. Uh. So uh, he uh, was, he, uh, this data got him out and then he went to just sit under the tree again. And uh, Sujata offered, uh, uh, offered, uh, I mean, maybe perhaps he went back to the village uh, very nearby to take. Uh. So there was this very significant event and he was meditating under Meta, uh, a banyan tree uh, when uh, Sujata came back and uh, offered him the food. Uh. So he gained the strength, you see. He gained the, the strength already. Then he realized that his way was not correct to practice asceticism, right? To torture the body like that uh, uh, was not the correct way, uh. Right, so then he resolved to change the way he took the middle part. Right, uh, he would eat a little, well, very little, uh, but he still would eat, and then uh, um, to keep his body healthy. Uh, so that's where he started to eat the food. Uh, right, last time was fasting, uh, hardly any food. Uh. Now, uh, probably one proper meal a day, even though uh, he was not uh, much. Uh, but at least uh, he did not torture himself so terribly and so big. Lah. So he gave up this practice of ascetism, lah, being ascetic. Lah. And then uh, he wandered around. So he wandered to a place called uh, Budagaya. This Budagaya is a place uh, where he got the enlightenment. You know? So he was after six years. You know, uh, so he left well, renunciation, 29 years old, left the palace at 29 years old. So he practiced asceticism and all the hard uh, sheep for six years. And then he, because now he didn't practice the asceticism already, right? So he had more strength already. Uh, so he could go across the river that had dried up already to this Mudagaya, beautiful place, right? And then he sat under the Bodhi tree. And it was corresponding to the Visat Ah, you meditated and he made that resolution, the determination that he would not get up from the tree until he found the truth. That means until he uh, uh, got enlightenment. Lah. And according to the account, Mara came. Oh, Mara actually uh, would be, uh, people say Satan or devil, but actually uh, it is from the mind, you know, the mind has all those terrible things of greed, anger, pride, all those things. You know? So these things that play up like in a dream uh, in your mind, you know? especially when you're trying to meditate, you know, all these things will come and catch out you, you know, right? all the forces of evil in the mind, right? uh, even uh, uh, beautiful ladies coming to tempt you. So this one is uh, showing that state of mind of Siddhartha as he struggled in his meditation. So this Mara, the evil one, tried to seduce uh, Gautama to tempt the goddess Bodhisattva. No, uh, you can have my daughters. La. So he was riding uh, in his uh, elephant, you know, all these personifications of the mind, uh, right? To let you have an account uh, of the struggle in the mind. So Wow, you know, great forces of the mind, the evil forces are trying to discourage uh, the Bodhisattva from meditating and to ask him to give up, uh, that sort of thing, you know. Uh, uh, these are the bad forces of the mind trying to uh, ask him to give up, uh, to prevent him from uh, getting enlightenment. Uh. But he had a strong mind. Right. He made the determination, so he overcame all these temptations and all these forces of Mara, got rid of them all from the mind. Right. So, of course, uh, you see that he was on the full moon day, corresponding to Visa, right? and he got enlightenment. He was under the Bodhi tree. So, Siddhartha Gautama attained supreme enlightenment to become a fully enlightened Buddha under the Bodhi tree by the bank of the Niranjara river. Uh, when we went to pilgrimage, we saw all these places are uh, described in the life of the Buddha. And he was 35 years old. 
as I said just now, it was on the full moon day of the Visa month. Uh, so, uh, usually in May, uh, Chinese calendar will be the fourth month, uh, the full moon. Uh, uh, so, it's a beautiful scenery uh, and you see a fully enlightened Buddha. He was so inspired though, right? He had found the perfect peace. The perfect happiness, uh, and he knew the truth of suffering. Uh, so that would be the Dhamma, right? That he had realized. Uh, so uh, that would be another uh, section already on the Dhamma. This one is his life, uh, right? In picture form. So he wandered around, and then uh, a very important event is when he preached the first sermon, the first teachings. Uh, and it was at this place called Sarnat, a very beautiful place. We also visited the place and it was at the deer park. And this deer park, not far away from one of the oldest cities, uh, Varanasi. Uh, this is the modern name. Uh, but the old name was Benares, uh, Benares. So it was at Varanasi, right? Uh, you actually very near the river. I mean, you could go to the river Ganges very easily also, right? And uh, it was at this deer park, you know, that the Buddha delivered the first sermon. He went to seek out the five disciples whom he associated with and practiced together uh, before he left on his own, uh, right? Uh, so he delivered that important first sutta called the Dhamma Chakapavana Sutta. Right? It's the turning of the Dhamma wheel to the five monks who also were practicing asceticism. And of course, it was in this sermon that he taught the first, uh, the first discourse, uh, the most important teaching in the whole of Buddhism called the Four Noble Truths. Right? So in another lesson, we go into the details of the Four Noble Truths. So, among them, the first to reach the first stage of sainthood, uh, right, was the, uh, was the monk Kundana, right, was the ascetic Kundana. And later on, uh, all of them also became uh, Arahans and Titan. Uh, so, that's the first sermon. So, his life uh, took on a different form. Uh, he had, uh, by then, uh, got the disciples already, the five disciples, and more and more, you know, uh, came to follow him because they could feel, could see that he was a fully enlightened one and they learned the Dhamma from him. But the life, you know, was Siddhartha, Gautama, but now, of course, uh, uh, Gautama Buddha, the fully enlightened one, he led a homeless life. Not like last time, uh, uh, in the palace, uh, so comfortable. Now it's a homeless life. Wandering from place to place, living maybe under caves, un, uh, in caves or under trees, right? Uh, before later on, uh, disciples build the kutis, uh, the huts and so on. Uh, but uh, a lot of all this wandering. His life was a wandering life, a homeless one, where he had to go and beg for food. Uh, so the Buddha and his disciples on their daily arms round, uh, you know this called Pintapat. Now up to today, we still have that. He used to do it even in Tallinn time when Achan Dhamma Buddha was around. Uh. And you know, we offer only four things allowed uh, to the Sangha members because they have renounced all the worldly things already, isn't it? So only four things can be offered to the monks uh, of the Sangha, uh, the clothing or, you know, like for example, uh, the rope, uh, one of it, uh, or maybe the uh, cloth uh, to make the ropes. Uh, uh, it should be like that. Uh, all right. And then food, uh, this one you know, you can see this is the arms bowl. Right? You put the thing there. Uh, and then lodging. Uh, later on, you, uh, you see that, as I said, uh, uh, disciples, uh, lay disciples also started to build, uh, um, you can see, viharas, uh, uh, like temples like that. Uh, not luxurious one, very simple ones like that. Uh. So some, uh, they sponsor those living places. Uh, because especially during the rain season, uh, so they cannot go wandering really this month. So they have to come to a place to stay, isn't it? So that's where you have the lodging uh, kutis uh, or the viharas. Uh, so now, of course, we still have this thing of supporting uh, the building of uh, Buddhist temples or viharas 
Hermitage and so on. Uh, and then the other one is uh, medicine. So of course, these are the four requisites only that can be offered. Now, this is a very interesting event, uh, right? That really shows fantastic uh, account of the Buddha's compassion. So one day with his uh, monk came uh, upon a uh, uh, very sick monk in his kuti, you know, this is a hut uh, the, the, the kuti. And uh, he was very, very sick uh, with dysentery, uh, passing motion, uh, very, very terrible. Maybe the body also got sores and so on. So uh, people uh, never bothered, the other monks are never bothered about him also. No? He was neglected. Uh? So his name was Tisa. So when the Buddha saw this when passing the Kuti, so he came to help him, you know, right? So he asked the other monks uh, uh, to bring the hot water la, and things like that, uh, right, to clean the monk. So the Buddha did all this, you know. Uh, make him comfortable, maybe talk to him, good Dhamma words, to ease his pain, you know. Or oh, the other monks, uh, maybe some of them maybe felt shameful. Uh. The master also went to tend to the sick, uh, and they, uh, uh, in the end, uh, they came to uh, uh, help also. Uh. Then he made a very important statement. Uh, uh, the Buddha said, you know, he who serves the sick serves me. Uh, you just, uh, you understand that? So it's not just praying, praying to the Buddha, you know. You have to follow his teachings and then also to help people to do dana. Because he said that, he who serves the sick serves me. So he didn't ask you to go and pray to him every day, pray, pray for this, pray for that. That's not the Buddhist way, not following dharma. You have to do works of compassion with dana. Apart from, of course, cultivating like meditation, learning sutta, and so on, and learning the Dhamma. Lah. So, this is a very important event. Right? Uh, there was another interesting event in the life of the Buddha, came to be known as the Twin Miracle. So, you know, he, one day he uh, was visiting uh, a clan, a tri I mean, at that time, uh, it was a, a group of others that they were quite proud, uh, they were practicing their religion, uh, Brahmism, uh, and they thought they had great psychic powers, you know. Uh, actually, uh, the word miracle uh, is not very suitable. Uh, it's actually the psychic powers uh, uh, that ordinary people could not do. So these people, uh, uh, some of the, especially the higher caste uh, Brahmin, uh, they thought, uh, some of their, their priests, uh, they thought they were the enlightened ones, uh, probably uh, got a lot of psychic powers, they couldn't uh, we match, you know, nobody can could compete with them, you know. But the Buddha had all those psychic powers, the greater psychic powers than anyone. He didn't want to show because that was not the important thing. But in this instance, he did show this fantastic psychic power. Uh, you want to call it a miracle also. Uh, okay, lah. he wanted to convince them uh, that he was uh, no ordinary person, right? He was the Buddha. And you know that miracle, uh, I think uh, nobody else had done it uh, except the Buddha. He rose from the river, right? And at the same time, uh, from the body, you know, the water and the fire came out. You know, fantastic psychic power. Of course, you have heard of uh, the miracles of Jesus Christ walking on water, which the Buddha could do also, and some other arahants could do. And then many other uh, miracles, like uh, reading the mind of people, telepathy, right? And knowing what is uh, ahead, psych uh, or even uh, psychokinesis with you no know, special powers of moving things and so on. But none can actually match this the twin miracle, right? So, of course, later on, they became convinced. Uh, and then... Uh, uh, they uh, follow uh, uh, the teachings uh, and became the disciples. Uh. So there was this twin miracle, very interesting uh, account. Then uh, you see, uh, seven years after he left, that means uh, not long later after his enlightenment, the Buddha went back to his previous family in the area of Kapilavas too. Uh, right? Beautiful place, a uh, countryside. Uh. So, at first the king was disappointed, but later on he came to terms, accepted, and, uh, you know, they gave food to him, offered food, and the Buddha uh, preached to his previous father, the mother, the wife, the son, and other people of the palace, uh, right? Uh, and 
Wow, they also are the minds develop until good levels, you know, very high levels because they were listening to the truth, the truth of the Dharma, right? And uh, according to the account, of course, uh, it was in the, it's in the scripture that the son, I think, uh, maybe around seven years old at the time, really, and he asked uh, one of his disciples to go and ordain him, ordain him to make him a monk. You know? <laughs> but nowadays, uh, you are under age. Uh, uh, you have to get the blessings because the Buddha later on uh, uh, had this in the Vinaya rules. Lah, because uh, too young, uh, parents uh, will be very, very sad, isn't it? Uh, but of course, when you're old adult, really, then uh, it's a different matter. So, but anyway, that is Rahula. Uh, uh, so, that's uh, uh, the count uh, of he reaching. So, how can we say that the Buddha is selfish? He went back to help the previous family, talk the Dhamma, and then, uh, in a way, uh, save them. Uh, otherwise, uh, Later on, everybody will die and they might go to a uh, woeful state, isn't it? But now they have reached very high level, already, maybe a first stage or second stage of sainthood already. So, how can we say selfish? It was a fantastic sacrifice. And then, with that compassion to come back to help, isn't it? So, there's another very interesting story that will give you uh, an idea of the, the order of nuns, right? Ah, uh, so it was actually the auntie. You know, remember, I told you, uh, the real mother died after seven days, and he was brought up by the auntie, the sister of the mother who passed away, Maha Pajapati Gautami, who actually treated him like a son. You know, brought him up just like a son, and later on, uh, you know, at the fifth year after the enlightenment, uh, so this particular uh lady, uh, Pajapati uh, went together with some other uh, ladies uh, to ask the Buddha for permission to become a nun. At first, the Buddha did not agree uh, <laughs> because it may be very tough for a lady. Uh, but later on, uh, Nanda appealed, the disciple appealed, and uh, permission was given. And since then, uh, of course, now today also we have order of nuns. Uh, uh, There's equivalent to monks, uh, like Ajahn Brahm's uh, monastery, you have the nuns also. Now, there's another very interesting account uh, of this Devadatta. Remember, I told you uh, when he was young, uh, he liked to you know, use a bow and arrows that would shoot the birds and so on. Uh. So he grew up and he became a monk also. And he also developed some psychic powers. But then uh, the uh, not so good qualities uh, came out. Uh, he became you know, very egoistic, wanting power. Uh, he wanted to take over the position of the Buddha. He asked, but Buddha did not allow because he did not have the good qualities like other monks like Sariputta, Ananda, uh, Mahakasapa, Mungalana, all this. So he made three attempts to kill the Buddha. The first one was he asked uh, people with the bows and arrows or the bowmen uh, to shoot the Buddha dead, to kill the Buddha. Uh. Well, of course, you know, you know, it's a natural law, you cannot kill the Buddha. In fact, all those Buddhas, uh, when they Felt the meta of Buddha, they became the disciples. Right? They really paid respect because they couldn't can't kill him. So there was another attempt, and this picture shows it that he attempted to crush, uh, to crush and kill the Buddha with a huge rock. You no, know? uh, you can see here. He knew that the Buddha was passing the place uh, in the uh, Jakuta Hill. So he actually pushed the rock down. You know? right? There was an uh, attempt uh, to kill the Buddha. But you can't kill a Buddha. He just, the rock just hit the one of the feet. So the toe, I think, uh, uh, so blood came out. So it was just uh, injured a bit, uh, wound. Uh. And that was a terrible thing. So many two. And one more occasion, he uh, caused a drunken elephant, intoxicated elephant, uh, to charge at Buddha uh, when he knew that the Buddha was coming together with the monk, asked the uh, I mean, he made the elephant drunk already and then somehow or other uh, drove the elephant to charge at the Buddha. Uh, so you can see in the next slide, right? Of course, uh, he wanted the animal to attack it. But then, of course, of course the monk was very, uh, Ananda, I think, uh, was very scared, wanted to protect the Buddha. But the Buddha said, you don't have to worry. Lah. Ah. So the Buddha radiated the metta, you know, metta, so strong loving kindness. Uh, uh, even the elephant coming near, I uh, just couldn't, uh, Touch the Buddha. The elephant was subdued, became gentle, right? And then uh, he laid down and paid respect also. Uh, 
Ah, because of loving kindness. So you see the power of metta. So for these three attempts, uh, not to kill the Buddha and all the bad qualities he had. Uh. So Buddha, uh, I'm not telling the story of Devadatta, uh, no time, uh, but in the end, he, uh, when he died, uh, he was uh, propelled to hell, right? to hell for a very long, long time for his uh, evil acts of attempting to kill the Buddha and some other you know, not good qualities. Uh, uh, but Buddha said one day he too will cut out of hell and become a Pachika Buddha. Right. But for the bad karma, he had to be reborn in the Abhichi hell. Right. Now, so the Buddha was growing older already and he preached for 45 years. Remember, I said that he left the palace right, at 29 and then six years he struggled, right, seeking the truth, practicing and at 35 he got enlightenment, isn't it? So for 45 years, he preached the Dhamma. Fantastic Dhamma, as now you have in the scriptures, no. Uh, very, very important scriptural books. Uh, they call it uh, the, the most original and authentic uh, is the five books. Uh, uh, I'm not doing the Nikayas. Uh, all written down, the teachings there, everything. And of course, uh, there was also the monks' rules, uh, the Sangha, uh, Vinaya, la, we call it the discipline and the rules for the monks. La. So then, uh, before long, uh, he knew that his time was uh, up already going to pass away into Parinibbana. So he called 60 uh, Arahants, uh, the disciples that had been, been enlightened already, have become enlightened already. Of course, the Buddha with psychic power, he could see the mind. Uh. So he told the uh, 60 Arahans, uh, the 60 Arahans, the disciples, they say you all will go to different places, right? You will be the messengers of the Dhamma, right? You teach the Dhamma to all, no discrimination, right? to all for the happiness and peace of all. That was a fantastic message. And say, let no two of you go the same road, right? Which means that you wanted the Dhamma to spread to far, far, or, I mean, different places, uh, all different places. So if four or five go together one place, uh, then you cannot uh, not spread so far, isn't it? Also, many places. So, so let not to walk the same path. There's a message. And today, uh, you know, we still have Dhamma spreading so fantastically. Uh, now, with the internet, uh, like now I'm using also the internet. Right, uh, to help to spread the good, sublime Dhamma, beautiful in the uh, in the start, beginning, beautiful in the middle, and beautiful in the end. Nothing can really match the sublime Dhamma. So, people uh, who are fortunate, they have the yen to come into the Dhamma, they are really blessed, right? So, we hope more and more can come and learn the Dhamma. So that is this very important event. Uh, the Buddha's uh, calling uh, to his disciples as often, or the Buddha telling the, uh, the 60 Arahants to go forth and spread the Dhamma. Right? Uh, then comes to the final important event. Uh, it happened at the place at Ushinaga in India, small town only. We went to that place, very, very touching. There's a temple there. I think uh, in uh, one of my postings uh, in the YouTube and the slide share, I had also done the Buddhist pilgrimage where you could see all the places and so on, uh, right? And so he uh, went to that place. At the time, he was 60 years old, right? And uh, he lay himself between two sala trees, right? His head facing north. So according to the Kaung, uh, even the Devas came, you know, right, uh, to pay the respect. And of course, uh, all the various uh, monks and disciples, uh, a few senior monks had passed away earlier. There are still many others, and you can imagine by that time, uh, there will be thousands and thousands of followers and monks already at uh, that time, right, including some nuns also. Right? He ordained uh, the Mahapajapati, isn't it? Uh, so, 
he was on the full moon day again, right? And the last watch of the night, towards the later part of the night, right? Then the Buddha passed away, and we say he went into Pari Nibbana, Maha Pari Nibbana means uh, he entered the Nibbana and he would not be reborn again already, right? Uh, that is the fantastic event, you know. But then when people, uh, before he passed away, actually, uh, Nanda only uh, had asked him uh, if he were to pass away, then who would be the teacher? Then the Buddha did not say, ah, this monk, that monk. Uh, so today, you have so many people fighting for powers. Uh. So the Buddha made that fantastic uh, statement of uh, saying that when I'm gone, your teacher will be the Dharma and the Vinaya. That means the teachings I've given you and the monastic rules and uh, regulations, these two things will be the teacher to you. Whereas you imagine if you had appointed somebody, uh, then later on there'll be a lot of trouble and quarrel. As today you can see, uh, right? Uh, this world wants to be the leader. Uh, not only in religion, uh, even in uh, other fields, uh, right? Many other fields. Today you know in politics, uh, I.O. So much uh, trouble. Uh, people are fighting to have power, isn't it? So, but in Buddhism, the greatest teacher will be the Dhamma. Right? And the uh, Buddha said the last words, uh, right? The last words before he passed from the Pari Nibbana, actually just summarize here. He actually, he said that uh, all conditioned things are impermanent. Uh, uh, all the things uh, you find, uh, things rise up and then they fall. Right? And they will be subjected to change, which means everything is impermanent. They depend on the conditions. When conditions are there, this event comes up. There comes up, and then it will go, right? Just as, uh, oh, you can have uh, wealth, but it's not forever and forever. The money can go off also. You can have good health. It's not forever. Uh, you can also get sick, or you have a good life. But again, it's impermanent, you have to die. So he said, uh, all these things will change impermanent. So the important thing is, the Buddha advised, uh, the last words are, uh, to strive on with diligence, with mindfulness, with diligence, with heedfulness. That means the uh, most important mission uh, that we have as human beings uh, is actually to strive on well in the Dhamma so that eventually, we too will enter Nibbana, the highest goal of the Buddhist. You see? Uh, of course, uh, before that, uh, you do gold and so on, you will be born into the heavens. But that thing also not permanent, right? Uh, but I think you, you know, because of good deeds, you're born into the heavens, good space and so on. But if it's not permanent, you come back. Uh, if you don't have enough of the a karma, good karma really you can be reborn in a woeful state or maybe reborn as a human being again and then to strive on again especially if you are born in the high heavens so the most important is the Dharma learn the Dharma understand the Dharma reflect the Dharma practice it well realize the Dharma and you will cross the sea of samsara which is birth that rebirth, and then it goes on and on. That's called samsara. And when you have that, there will always be suffering, right? Uh, so that is this important message. So it's a very, very inspiring thing. So now we come, and now the end slide, you know, I just picked this particular one where the Buddha was giving one of the teachings, uh, the Dhamma, you see uh, thousands of people, uh, the lay people further back, I think, uh, right? uh, you find usually the monastics uh, uh, will be in front, uh, right? So, remember, so you can make that aspiration, and that aspiration is what? May we strive on diligently in the Dhamma to put an end to all forms of Dukkha, Dukkha is suffering, uh, and attain the bliss, the happiness of Nibbana, uh, uh, work very hard to practice the Dharma, right? Then you end all suffering and enter into Nibbana, perfect happiness, peace, and freedom. So, may you all be well and happy. 
and continue to thrive on in the Dharma, right? And so I hope uh, this particular presentation of life of the Buddha, right, in pictures, right? of course, with the explanation, I see pictures, you don't understand, right? So that it is uh, inspiring you. Right? Yeah, I have uh, heard this, I have done this many, many times, but every time I do it, I still feel inspired and the profound joy and peace in the mind. Ah, so if you go over again and again, reflect on it. So that's a fantastic practice of the Dhamma, to reflect on the Dhamma and the life of the Buddha, his qualities and so on. Right? Ah, so I hope all of you have learned important things. Right? Ah, this is one of the unusual presentations. Ah. Uh, I suddenly had this idea I had to do it uh, again. Uh, right? So now, before we say sadhu, I would like to thank all of you students. Of course, um, some primary students can understand also, seven, five, and six, and then secondary students, college, universities, and the teachers of uh, Buddhism. So to all of you, I say sadhu, right? And I would like to express the appreciation. Uh, sadhu to all of you lah, uh, who take the time and the effort and energy to follow this presentation and hopefully you all get inspiration with the, by the listening to following an account of the life of the Buddha in pictures, right? So let us now say Sadhu three times. Sadhu, Sadhu, Sadhu. We all be well, happy, and peaceful. Take care.